morning. Oh, please, please, I know you needed to stretch a little bit. I'm going to, I'm going to move around and give you a quick PowerPoint, only 40 or 50 minutes. Now, we asked Blake, I said, you know, I, I, I like doing PowerPoints. It, it seems to be a little more entertaining than hearing me make another speech and to you and to me. And, and he said, well, you're the governor and I'm not. So, of course, you can do a PowerPoint. So, the, ner the staff has been a little bit nervous. Because you know what will happen on occasion, we'll get all of this technology going, then we hit the button and nothing happens. And if that happens, we're going to all sing some hymns. No, we're going to move forward. All right, if we get the first slide going, if you'll look at the screens, we're going to talk about our great economic development opportunities and educational opportunities. This looks a little large, and if you're in the back of the room, I'm going to help you read it. Educational priorities this year, we call it Education Works, because in fact it does. I can tell you as a small kid and, uh, from Moorhead, Mississippi, who in about the third grade found out I was dyslexic. I, I just thought I was dumb. Uh, you know, the other kids sort of said he just can't read, and the teacher finally in the fifth grade said, don't say that. Don't you believe that? Because I've seen you, Phil, get up in front of the class and make a speech and talk to them, so I know, well, maybe that was the first arbiter of what I was going to do for a living, but she said, I know you can do that. So we have kids that are now trapped in educational systems that are failing. Let's confront the bold facts. About half of our children, 46% of our third graders can't read at a third grade level. They're not proficient at a third grade level. And what we normally do is pass them on to the fourth grade. It's like an assembly line. It's sort of like Toyota and Nissan. That's important that they keep that line going. But if something goes wrong, they stop it. And anyone along that line has the opportunity to stop it and say, we're going to fix this before we move forward. One of the things that y'all have helped do that has been remarkable is building blocks. I want to thank you. Blake Wilson and all of you led the way. Four years ago, four years ago, this group came together. The business community came together and said, we believe in early childhood education. And, and not only do we believe in it, but we're going to fund it. We're, gonna, we're not going to ask the legislature for money. Now, this year I'm asking them for $3 million to continue this great program that we have. You and I know about 90% of the kids currently today are in some type of daycare center. That's just the way of the world. And so what we've got to do is get an educational environment in those centers so those kids can learn and be prepared for kindergarten and be prepared for the third grade. And we can diagnose them and determine if they've got issues for reading. So one of the things that we're going to talk about doing early is our third gate. Now this is a dynamic move. It scares a lot of people, but what we say, if that child can't read at the third grade level, stop it right there. Don't socially promote him on to the fourth grade. Last night I was watching a speech of the governor of Virginia, and Bob is my friend, and, and he was saying that they have the same type of thing in the fourth grade. As his state of the state, he was saying to Virginians, we've stopped the failure at the fourth grade. And I thought how amazing it is that we're beginning to think alike across America. We can't continue to accept failure. Now, don't get me wrong, there's great teachers and great administrators. And we ought to lift them up. I, I met a young lady for Teach for America here this morning. They do a fantastic job, and we're going to ask the legislature to help us fund that even more. But we've got to say at that third uh, gate, that third grade level, teach them to read. We've asked the legislature to put $15 million into a program to intervene, to get those dynamic coaches, if you will. And I like to use that analogy because I know a little bit about football. Mark Keenum's here. He knows a little bit about football. And, and what you do is you get a new coach, and you expect that coach to win. And so we're going to get coaches $15 million worth of them. We're going to go to that third grade, and we're going to say you're going to teach that child to read because we're going to make sure that we get Teach for America in there if we have to. And if you can't, then I'm going to recommend to the principal a replacement. We've just got to confront these bold facts. And so that third gate is so very important. Reward teachers. I have this crazy idea that you ought to pay people that really do good more money. It's a radical concept, but I think if they achieve and they move that class forward, and I'm not expecting them to take a, a class that's failing and make it a star, but have progress. Move them forward, if you will. And so we're going to say that we need merit pay to make sure that if you've got a teacher who is being exceptional reward that teacher 
We've got programs already, if you look, Gulfport, Clarksdale, Rankin, and Lamar County, those courageous superintendents have said, I, I will do that. I will be the pilot program. If you want to pay teachers more, if you want to pay my best teachers more, I'm in. Now, I have an idea. Next year, if the legislature will help us with this $2 million, you're going to see other superintendents raising their hands saying, my teachers, my good teachers want more. My master teachers can have another level. Nobody's going to get a pay cut. But I don't think in this legislative environment with this governor, you're going to see across-the-board pay raises. That's just not going to happen. You see, we just don't think you ought to just sit down and say, it doesn't matter if you're excelling in your class or you're just showing them videos. We're going to pay you all the same. A great teacher in a great classroom. Pay them more. Make sure we incentivize them. Continue funding ongoing research. As we said in building blocks, I jumped on that first because I'm so excited about it. Attract the best and brightest, $1 million, for e $1 million for scholarships for high-performing students. Here's what we do. What happens if your child makes a 28 on the ACT? Law school, medical school, maybe you want to be a journalist like Sian. No, you, you know what, you, you're trying to steer them towards somewhere else, going to the banking business. You don't want them to be teachers. And so what we've got to say is that child making a 28 on the ACT, take them to the classroom, and for a million dollars, I can help a scholarship, a $10,000 a year scholarship for these children to put the best and the brightest in the classroom if they'll teach for five years. Now, I'd also like to ask that you make at least a 21 on your ACT before you can become a teacher. Oh, you're going to have shrieking and gnashing of teeth. There are going to be people that say, your, your Phil Bryant just wants to cause a teacher shortage, and that's what's going to happen. Well, now look, I think I made a 19. And that was in the old dark ages when you didn't have a book to go by and they didn't teach you, you know. My kids started taking it when they were 14. I mean, they just, now you tell you, I thought you just took it once. You just showed up at a designated classroom. You took the ACT, and that was it. And you were forever marked by it, good or bad. If I can make a 19, these kids can make a 21. Make a, at least be able to achieve that if you want to be a teacher. And they say, well, what, what about those kids that can't make a 21? I'm not sure I want them in the classroom. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm not being mean here. But if you can't make a 21, do I want you teaching my children? So we're going to incentivize them. We want kids that are in junior college and community college I'm old community college and that says you know I, I've been here two years I, I didn't know what my major was but now I've decided I want to be a teacher and, and I'm making a 3.5 I made a 28 on my ACT I can get a two-year scholarship at a great university at a teaching university and so let's make sure we prepare them to get in there and then they've got a roadmap to success because they can say, you know, I'm not just going to be stalled out at $40,000. I'm not going to be stalled, stalled out. There's a pathway to success that I can follow as a teacher, getting those great teachers in the room. Now you want to talk about something that really moves things, open enrollment. Oh, I felt the earth move for just a moment there. That means a child can go to any school he wants to. Horror upon horrors. We've got 150 little walls that we build up out there, and we surround these schools, and we say, you can't get in, you can't get out. If you try to get out, if you tell the school you're living with your grandmother so you can go to a better school, we're going to send a detective, almost like a law enforcement officer, out to seek you out and stop that. Knock on your door in the dark of night. That child doesn't live here. He can't go to school here. When, when did we decide that? You know why? Because the child... The money follows the child. Yeah, I was auditor. I know how that works. And that's not a bad thing. That's a great thing. Money's going to follow the child. But why don't we say, let's take those walls down. Let's let that child, if, if there's a class, a school across town that he'd like to go to, well, on earth would we say, you can't do that. You can only shop at Kroger. I love Kroger. But you can't go anywhere else. Better it be the Dollar General, because I really love the Dollar General. Oh, you know, that's a guy's store, guys. Come on. So you, can, you, you can't go to any place else. That's the only place you can go and buy your groceries. You know, I, I don't know many things in the world that we say you can't. This is the only place you can go, and we're never going to let you out. Now, here's the key. Listen to me before everybody goes into shock. The accepting school has to be willing to do that, and they have to have the capacity. They have to say, I'll accept 
20, 30, 50 kids, and I have the classroom capacity and the teachers to do it because I'm willing to bring them in. So we're not going to force, it's not going to be a bunch of kids from, oh, heaven's sakes, one school district flooding into another and them having all of those problems. They've got, you know, today the Mississippi law says you can do that if both school districts agree. So, so we have an open enrollment law. We just, it's just impossible to use because to get both schools to agree to let a child out, to set him free, to let parents make that decision. We say let parents have a choice so a child can have a chance. And you know what we call that too? Competition. You know what those schools losing those kids are going to do? They're going to figure out a way to get better. Now, this is not going to be cheap. It's not going to be free. We asked for roughly $24 million more this year to go into education we did last year. And I'm willing to make those commitments. We're going to keep moving. Workable charter school bill. Look, I, I was for charter schools and charter schools wasn't cool. Five years ago, I went to Helena, West Helena, Arkansas, and then I went to New Orleans, and I looked into the faces of those children. Never mind. You can have arguments. We can be here all day long. Go to a charter school and look at those children. Look into their eyes at the hope and the excitement that they know that they have now, that they're going to be able to go to college, that they're succeeding. Now, they go to 5 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, and they go on Saturday sometimes, and they don't have a football team or a band, but they choose to be there. Their parents stand in line. They go through raffles. Tears flow from their eyes when their children's names are not chosen by, in that raffle. But what we do, not a chance. We're going to keep you there. We're not going to let you out. You're going to harm it. You're going to create private schools. Really? Do you think this governor, this legislature, this lieutenant governor, this speaker in 2013 want to create a private school system using public funds? That's the craziest thing I've ever heard of. We're trying to help children trapped in failing schools. What we're doing now is simply not working. All right, I know I, Blake's looked at his watch one time, so we've got to move. Next slide. Opportunity scholarships where people can donate, either individuals or uh, corporations can donate, and then we can scholarship a child into a non-public school. That's right, we actually take money that people donate, not out of the general fund, they donate, they get a tax credit for it. I love tax credits and ta cutting people's taxes. I know some people think corporations don't pay enough taxes. I'm not one of them. But if you want to help that child get into a non-public school, send them there. Now, you've got to be below 250% of the poverty level, and you've got to be in a DNF school. And, and, and again, so the opportunity is to help those children trapped in school, opportunity scholarships. Florida did it. They put about $35 million back into education. They saved so much money because they'd say, your opportunity scholarship's worth $7,000. Private school said, I'll take it, and they normally spend about nine to ten thousand dollars. I'll use those numbers, somebody will correct me later. But for demonstrative purposes, that's about what happened. And they put the other three back into the general fund and then back into education. That's what sold me on. We're going to move through quick. Um, high, school uh, high schools with graduation rates lower than 80% must submit a plan to us. We've got to stop this. I hope I've got this right. 1,200 children dropped out, roughly 1,200 children dropped out of school last year. Dropped out of high school. Now what type of future do they have? Now what we did last year, we had a dual enrollment program where we said before that child drops out of school, let's put them in a community workforce training center. Let him be a welder, a plumber, an electrician. Let's honor those great craftsmen. My dad was a diesel mechanic. He was one of the best in the country. I know because other people told me. And we were proud of that. Your dad's the best diesel mechanic I've ever met. Boy, what a sense of pride that was. I had a level of success in my family if you own your own tools. I had the great opportunity of going to some tremendous schools with some tremendous teachers. Worked hard. Have a couple of degrees from a couple of colleges. Had an opportunity to teach at college level. Had some level of success in the political world. We can do this. What we're doing now is just simply not working. And so if you will help us continue to work for jobs for Mississippi graduates, $1 million there, they have a 93% success rate with kids about to drop out of school. 93%, I'll take that. If you look at Teach for America, again, these kids, and I say kids because they look like kids to us, they, they come from all over America to teach here, to be a part of this system, and they do such a remarkable job. Career and technical education in high schools. It's not just shop anymore. They don't just make birdhouses like most of us did, my. 
You know, all of us took that birdhouse home and our mothers pretended to like it. We teach them modern skills. Because I can tell you, as I go about bringing business and expanding our existing businesses and going globally around the world, they want to know how is your educational system, not only for the children that they may bring here, but for the workforce. Now, just now I can tell you we have the best workforce in America. No, no, I, I, I know that because I talked to Mr. Toyota. I talked to Alexei Mordashev. I talked to people who bring their businesses here who say this is a phenomenal. I was in Aurora the other day, Aurora Flight Services, 250 more in the aerospace industry. We have a tremendous workforce. Now, we've got to keep moving ahead. We've got to educate these children. There's some ideas here that will make people uncomfortable. We're not going to get them all through the first year. But if MEC will help, if we'll just simply say, let's move education forward. Let's do something. Don't stand by anymore. This is too important for us to ignore. I believe at the end of this session, we, go, we will all look back and say that is the moment that we made the difference. And MEC, as always, was a great part of it. Thank you so much for having me. God bless you.